Hi there. Welcome to uh, Facebook Live, a Going Green Facebook Live. I am Lisa Bronner, and today I have the great pleasure of hosting uh, Francis Morlape, whose landmark book in 1971, Diet for a Small Planet, started a movement. At the time, she may have felt like a lone voice talking about plant-based eating, but in the 50 years since the publication of that book, uh, she has inspired many, many people, and I can't have a conversation with anybody in, uh, in my circles without them saying that book was the one that got me going, that was my reference, that was my guide. Uh, and so Francis is celebrating the 50th anniversary with a new edition of Diet for a Small Planet, gorgeous book. She has been very busy since that time writing many other books, tackling many world issues that we are going to discuss today. Um, and also some of the features that have stayed the same and some uh, new content that has been in her book. Uh, but we also want to talk about uh, plant-based eating as a, as a healthy lifestyle and reasons people uh, choose it, reasons people hesitate. And uh, hopefully we will um, have some uh, new information for you today. So I wanna welcome Francis to the conversation and to going green. Welcome, Francis. Thank you. I feel very welcome. Super, super. So I have had the joy of getting to know uh, Francis over the past uh, few weeks. And one of the things that struck me is that I still feel like the industry that we're in, you know, sort of healthy living is, is fairly new. I mean, it's been in my adulthood. Um, but you and my grandfather, Dr. Bronner, were doing uh, doing your thing back when there wasn't a whole lot of people on board uh, back when there wasn't you know a lot of uh industry it wasn't in the mainstream it wasn't in the conversation um what did it feel like back then to be introducing this idea of plant-based eating in in 1971 well i didn't really know what i was doing you know <laughs> i was just asking a question i was 26 sitting in the UC Berkeley library asking, oh, is it really true that we don't have enough food to feed people? And, you know, we have to cut back, cut back, cut back on everything. And it was a terrifying time. And so I was sitting there asking, is it true? And when I learned that, no, there's more than enough for all of us, that just awakened a whole sense of possibility for me. And from there, of course, I started learning about how actually it was our grain fed meat centered diet that was so full of vast waste. Just one statistic to start with that about 80% of our agricultural land is used to feed livestock. They return to us only 18% of our calories. So wow. it's just like a giant shrinking machine, right? And That's right. I wanted to say, wait a minute, this is so irrational. And then I began to learn more and more about how unhealthy it is and how destructive it is on so many levels. And of course, now, uh, these decades later, we know about the climate crisis connection. And I'd love to talk about all of that. But back then, it was just I wanted to say to people, no, actually, <laughs> there is enough. And here are some ways to expand our possibilities. So that was wow. And I really thought well, about 500 people would read the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm thankful for your curiosity because um, you're asking those questions and finding answers to them. I mean, has really jump-started so much and and uh, and paved the way for for more research and awareness and improvements in individual lives. Um, before we keep going, I, I'm so eager to talk to you. I forgot to. Uh, to uh, share with our audience that not only do we get the joy of, of hearing uh, from Francis Moore LaPay today, but we also have a giveaway. And uh, so we are going to be giving away 10 copies of the 50th anniversary edition of Diet for a Small Planet, along with 10 sets of Dr. Bronner's Magic All One Chocolate that we launched this past year. And this is a plant-based chocolate uh, vegan ingredients, 70% dark chocolate, and has a great story behind it that you can read about on the Going Green blog. So if you would like to enter our giveaway for um, a book and a set of chocolate, all you have to do is like the Going Green Facebook page. So hit the like on the Facebook page. 
And then also you have to join the comments. You have to write in the comments either a question for our conversation and we're gonna have a Q&A time later on or uh, share a favorite plant-based recipe that one of your go-tos that uh, is just easy, you don't have to think about it, you might not even have to look at a piece of paper, um, the things that you toss together. So enter our giveaway and uh, we'll look forward to getting to some of your questions a little bit later on in our conversation. Uh, so I want to uh, set on that statistic you shared, which really like it, it just it just encapsulates the situation that 80% of our land is producing grain. Agricultural land, yeah. Agricultural land mm -hmm. is producing grain to feed the livestock that provides us with 18% of our food. And as you said, incredible shrinking machine. I, that's exactly what it is. It just doesn't make sense. It's incredibly inefficient. So you, you started following that and realizing that there was a better way. There's a better way. And that's before I knew all of the health consequences, et cetera, as I said. And Lisa, that includes also grazing land. So it's cropland and grazing land is that, mm -hmm. is that uh, vast number. Uh, I want to do something first is give a big shout out to my daughter, Anna Lope, because without her, I don't think that new edition would exist. And she really encouraged me, mom, we've got to do this. And she helped in so many ways. So thank you, Anna. <laughs> Absolutely. And Anna has done so much in her own right. She's got some great talks. Uh, if you search for her on YouTube about her travels and her experience and observations. Uh, so I highly recommend people look into what she has done. Um, and I'm sure she would probably say that she couldn't do what she does without you. So my guess. Why don't you share what were some of the things that uh, are new in the 50th anniversary edition that um, I've seen some pretty battered copies of the 1971 <laughs> edition. So what what can people look forward to in the in the 50th anniversary edition? Well, I do share my journey there. So there is a story of how did this all happen? And I. I hope it is meaningful because I, I really think the personal story is so important. And in terms of what has changed, of course, we now know about the climate crisis and the way that our food system has contributed. 37%, as much as 37% of the greenhouse gas equivalents are from our food system. And about 40% of that is livestock. So we, we know now so much more uh, about the harms and, and additionally, the health harms. I just learned fairly recently that the World Health Organization has deemed red meat a probable carcinogen and processed wow. meat a carcinogen. And why isn't our you know, food and drug people, why aren't they telling us this, right? I have a guess, but you know, we know so much more about the harms Diabetes, for example, our diet diabetes has grown four to five times since I wrote the book. And of course that has to do with all the processed foods and, and uh, uh, additives in sugar, et cetera. So we, you know, I, I think to myself, wait, we're the brightest species, aren't we? And yet we are, have turned feeding ourselves into killing ourselves. <laughs> wait, how did that yeah. happen? You know, every other species goes for what is best for itself. and we've just turned food into a health threat and a climate threat. And then of course, uh, close to half of farmers are harmed by pesticides are poisoned every year and farm workers. So there's that element. And then there's the species decimation from all of the pesticides that we're using. In fact, the, the, the noted historian, David Attenborough, and I start the book with his estimate that we are in the sixth great extinction and we can't, of you know, especially insects and important important ingredients in our bias that um, that with our current diet we can't reverse that. That it takes up so much of our land that the only way forward is to move to a plant and planet centered diet. <laughs> Absolutely, I, I love that twist, plant and planet centered, because it is all connected. <laughs> Now, as you started with saying, back in the early 70s, the big concern was overpopulation and that we were going to have a, a too big of a population to uh, be able to sustain it with uh, our, our food production. Um, and so, you know, global famine was, was, I don't know, one of the headline issues. But you have since realized, discovered that plant-based eating and planet-based eating is really tied into a whole lot of other 
um, global issues. Uh, what what are some of those that you've discovered have um, you know become very pressing and maybe uh, headlines in more recent years? Well, I think just the dominance of monopolies or oligopolies, but tight, tight control in our food system that every piece of our food system, you know, if it in, especially in, you know, the meat processing and every stage of the way, there's just a few corporations, seeds, for example, when I wrote my first book, there were dozens and dozens of seed companies, and now there are three or four. And yeah. so there's no competition. And so farmers are more and more just victims of concentrated power. And that power then influences our political system. And I think that that's why that this information, for example, about the cancer hazards of a meat center diet is not getting out. I learned recently that there are actually more lobbyists in Washington from the agribusiness industry than from oil and gas. Mm. And there are now about 20 lobbies in Washington for every person that we've elected to represent wow. us in Washington. So I, I think that we have to uh, embrace uh, the, the question of democracy itself, answering to the interest of the people at, if we are to address all of the harms that are related to our food. And so that's why, you know, I sort of walk on two feet here where my food step and then also how do we create a more a genuine democracy answering to us and not to private interests. Right, because it's hard to get the information out there when there are so many voices that are trying to silence it like information such as that red meat is is not i mean it is very harmful to our health uh, and processed meat like even more so um it, it almost seems like then we have you know the uh organizations that are promoting you know childhood nutrition and stuff but they're all at odds with one another um because of private interests and such so that's now do I recall you you recently wrote a book about about this concept of, of democracy? Um, it's called Daring Democracy. There we go. There we and go. It's about what we can do now. And uh, this is what I'm continuing to write about. And so I want to, uh, you know, really always have, uh, the, you know, I always thought that, you know, but food is what is so personal. We make these choices every day. And so I thought it had this special power, and I still do, that we know that every day that what we put into our mouth is linking us to everything. And so I think that all of us, by helping people understand what is healthful for, healthful for them, for us, and how mm -hmm. hard it is to, to see, can awaken all sorts of broader understanding of what is what is right, wrong, and, and what we can make right in our political system as well. So I think of food as a great teacher in that way. And it reminds, as I say, you know, just every day we make a choice and we know that those choices ripple out. And, you know, I tell people that when you choose organic, what are you doing? You're helping yourself, but you're also creating a market so that farm workers and farmers aren't, aren't hurt by the toxic chemicals. So you know, that we're, we're connected with people and the soil and the plants. Oh, when we right. You can't talk about one without, without looping in everything else. Uh, I love, I love what you said about food being the great teacher. And it's a classroom that we're constantly in because yes. <laughs> uh, we all are eating every single day. And, um, and it's important for the individual to realize that they have a part to play. Uh, they might feel, you know, I'm just one person here in my house, um, but they have a, they have a part to play. You know, and uh, each of us making these decisions. I mean, we have seen in recent years, like just even the organic section of, in our produce uh, in our mainstream stores has has boomed, and um, that's because people have bought it and requested it, and therefore the demand, the the supply has grown. So, you know, where can that go if we continue to to request it? The prices have also come down, which is another yes. thing that will uh continue as as it becomes more in demand um i want to pause again and remind our viewers who uh, what we're doing here and what we have for them so i'm lisa bronner and we are talking today with francis moore le pay author of the 1971 book diet for a small planet which is celebrating its 50th anniversary edition and in our conversation we're also going to be giving away 10 copies of uh, diet for a small planet as well as 10 sets of Dr. Bronner's 
uh, plant-based um, magic all one chocolate and it's 70 percent dark chocolate and it has a story you can read on my uh, on my blog going green uh, to enter our giveaway, please like the Going Green Facebook page and join our comment section with either a question for our discussion or a favorite plant-based recipe. So we'll look forward to reading that, reading the recipes afterwards, and we're going to get to some of the questions in a little, a little while. So uh, one of the big obstacles that people do have to plant-based eating are is the idea of protein, and we need more protein and 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 plants don't have sufficient protein. Um, and you address this in your book in a section about protein myths. What, what are the biggest ones that you say, you know, stop people from eating more plant-based? Well, first thing to know is that Americans on average eat twice the proteins our bodies can use. And wow. our bodies don't store protein as protein. It just comes in, it gets converted just as plain energy, right? So that's the first you know, we don't have to worry, we're eating so much more than we need. And the other thing I, I have to say, I think, well, at the time I wrote my first book, there was such an emphasis on this idea of complementary proteins that somehow plant proteins need to be balanced in ways that their amino acids balance out so they'll be equal to animal protein. And that was the science, that's what the science said then, and I, I included it in the early book. And now basically they're saying, don't worry. If you eat a variety of food in the plant world, it all works out and you'll get plenty of what you need. So just forget about balancing, you know, the, the particulars. And I love that. It just makes it all the easier. And so um, it's, it's, a, it's a really healthy. And I have to say, too, that when I moved from a meat center diet, I grew up in Cowtown, Fort Worth, Texas. Um, and ate a lot of ha hamburgers for dinner and meatloaf. Um, that when I started, just just encourage people. Just one person speaking, but I know that I that a lot changed for the positive, and just in terms of my energy. And I, 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 I just didn't. I didn't have cravings. I just felt satisfied. Something really mm -hmm. shifted so that instead of worrying about food and worrying about gaining weight, you know, which is what Texas girls did then, um, I just relaxed and I could, I just started wanting what my body needed and enjoying it. And so I hope it's that way for others. But for me, it was just this liberation, not a sacrifice. Yeah. What would you be able to estimate um, for some of our, our viewers what? what would be a sufficient amount of protein in a day from plant-based sources, from beans and nuts and, and um, high protein vegetables and such, um, just so they could visualize, you know, what, yeah. what the serving would look like? Well, all I, all I know how to say is just that everything that we've read is that if you eat a variety of uh, fresh vegetables and uh, particularly well, the, the center of protein world for plant food is the legume family mm -hmm. of peas, beans, and lentils. And um, uh, by the way, peanuts are actually part of that family, I learned not too long ago. So yes, uh, you can be sure if you have something in that world, you are getting a higher you know, percentage of protein than peas, beans, and lentils. But virtually everything, the grains we eat, um, for dinner, I had quinoa uh, that the, the white and the dark together. I really mm -hmm. like, and I love it also because it's it's fast to cook. <laughs> but um, you know that has some, and you know all of our grains do. Uh, so basically, if we're eating healthfully, we do not have to worry about protein. That you know you 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 get enough, and just right yourself. So now there. Are there certainly is a whole lot more available to um, plant-based eating uh, in grocery stores, in restaurants, um, cookbooks and such. I recall when I was in college several decades ago in North Carolina, my brother David, who was vegan at the time, but that it was not common, uh, came to visit me and he really struggled with finding vegan food when we were eating out. Um, you know, the term wasn't familiar. He would say no 
animal products and they would say, well, is cheese okay? And, um, you know, and, and that's changed a lot. And I live in Southern California now and every restaurant has vegan options, even if they're a steakhouse. Um, oh, and so, so that has grown and, and, and improved a lot. But at the same time, on the protein side of things, we also have had this rise of protein dense um, diets, uh, eating plans. I remember Atkins back in the 90s, and then everything has kind of evolved since then. You've got so many, uh, you know, paleo and keto and all of these really protein dense diets. Why have these two different paths sort of emerged at almost the same time? I'm not sure, I know, but I, I'm very aware. I, um, yeah, I, I don't really understand it, but one of my great missions is to free people from that worry. And I wanted to add, Lisa, that at the in this new book, we um, we to talk. You know, we have a little chart at the end about you know how much protein from this and that, so that people can right. see you know the grams of protein and and just let go of that. I think um, there's just so much science now saying that that is not a concern yeah. and that and that we're yeah we we are just converting that extra protein into energy and it's not really good. right. Well, are there other health risks of eating too much protein? You know, I don't I don't know. I, I, I know that if I, you're focused on protein. You would probably be missing a lot of the world of of grains and greens and fruits and fish, all these things that absolutely the, the you know I I feel so lucky that I can you know just experiment with different different foods because you know each category has something special to offer. So I think the more we vary what we eat, the, the better it is. <laughs> absolutely, and plant based eating is so wonderfully colorful. Like yes. I mean it's it's you've got the vibrancy of the whole rainbow of foods and you know every plant-based dish i look at you've got oranges and purples and greens and yellows <laughs> and uh it's just beautiful which i enjoy eating beautiful food i think that's kind of a common <laughs> a common thing um one of the i uh one of the issues i've heard raised with uh the concern about about meat is that definitely in American history, meat has been a status symbol, like your ability to buy meat, um, which used to be, you know, much more expensive compared to uh, um, standard income. Um, but eating meat was a status thing. And that as other countries, uh, developing countries are, are emerging, and such that their meat consumption is going up. Mm -hmm. um, and here we are at a point where we're trying to pull it back down have you have you had any conversations uh, on the on the topic of meat as status or as well i i agree completely it certainly was when i was growing up and i think in the early edition i quote something that what is the meat that you would serve your brother-in-law as if you really had to impress that person you know um so i i know that's true but i think it's shifting i do i think that the appeal, and as you pointed out so strongly, the beauty of uh, the plant-based, plant and planet-based meals is really spreading appreciation and, and that uh, and interest and intrigue, you know, well, there's something different. And I think also what's different now than 50 years ago was people appreciate more all the beautiful cuisines from around the world, uh, you know, from Latin America, from Asia that are plant-based. So I think there's much more openness, you know, to go to an Indian restaurant and have all these wonderful tastes, but you're not eating a steak, you know? You, yeah. you, you just could have delicious meals with the no meat. So I think that is, that is really changing. I don't feel that the way I did when I was growing up. Yeah, I think there is much greater variety. I know as an adult, I learned about vegetables that I, you know, so many more than I knew of as a child. Um, and it wasn't just that my mom had a limited, uh, limited palate at all. She actually was an amazing home cook, but, um, you know, kale and persimmons and endive and radicchio and, um, you know, so many, so many other vegetables that I had never even heard of. It wasn't that we didn't eat. I just never heard of them. Uh, but now I could find that at my most basic grocery store, a lot of that. Yeah. So that's been a good, a very good development, I would say. Yeah. So yeah, and even in the last few years, you know, we have a little office, our 
Small Planet Institute does, uh, right in the center of, of Cambridge. And I remember when I first moved into this office, I had to, you know, if I wanted to go out for lunch, I had to really search. And now there are probably three or four, yeah, four places within easy walking distance that really emphasize plant-based eating. And that is a huge change in just years, you know, just a few years. I yeah. Love it. Yeah, that's so differences are being made. You might have, you know, if you compare uh, 1971, even in Berkeley um, to now, there's just there is a lot more availability. And that is that is a good thing. Um, I want to get into some of the how to steps because, you know, people might have a, a desire to eat more plant based, but um, they don't know where to start. So first of all, I want to mention to our to our readers that that this book is half cookbook. Um, now, it, it's like this book has something for everyone. If you need the statistics, it's got the statistics. If you need, you know, need Francis' personal story, that's in here too. Uh, whatever road you need to walk. But if you just need recipes, like this much of the book is recipes and you collected them from quite, quite a few <laughs> sources. Tell us about the anthology that you created here. Well, it started out, I want to thank you, Betty Valentine because Betty Valentine was one of the founders of paperback publishing in America. And my little manuscript, my little booklet, my first thoughts got into her hands and my life has changed. And so she was the one who recommended the recipes. And I said, oh, great idea, Betty. And I called all my friends and I said, send me, send me, send me ideas. And then I, you know, I was, I had so much fun tinkering and playing and, and a lot of the the recipes credit the people who I first got the recipes from. And then uh, in this new edition, we have wonderful celebrity chefs who've offered recipes. Um, so it, it, uh, it, it's grown from just that early day of, of you know, like uh, there's something in there called Frankish Feijoada. And this came from a Brazilian friend I had way back then. Who, and uh, and I, uh, it's a classic, Brazilian dish, dish of it's kind of a black bean stew. Um, yeah. So um, there, but I have to say that uh, I may be the only cookbook writer, if this is a cookbook, uh, that is trying to free people from cookbooks because I really hope that these are like ideas that you, oh, I didn't think you could about combining that and that and oh, I made it, but maybe if I did this with it, it would my, you know, I'd like, you know, just, I want people to have fun in the kitchen. And so I, I really hope that these recipes stir that sense of imagination, you know, thinking, oh, I didn't know those two things came together. And like one of my recipes in there is for a carrot and onion soup, carrot and onion rice. And every time I make it now, I'm, I'm tinkering and adding stuff. And then my partner, I don't know what he did the other night, but he added something. I said, oh, wow, he put nuts in there or something. Oh, yum. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really that's the spirit of this book and so the range is very wide of types of recipes like there are some classics of casseroles like there's an eggplant um, parmesan casserole that I just mm. love the combo of eggplant and parmesan and um, and each one by the way we either mark it as if it's vegan or could easily be made vegan so we're trying to really be the big tent in that way um but uh, yeah, I, I think, um, uh, and then, you know, one of the recipes that's been in there, just to mention another classic one of the book is called the Walnut Cheddar Loaf. And mm -hmm. uh, so Anna and I made that for, I think it was a Christmas one, uh, time special thing. And you put it out and then you drip, you know, some cheddar cheese melting on top of it. So it looks really like, a special center of the meal for our uh, yeah. time. So they range from very, you know, so just kind of stir fried things that you can do really quickly to more formal things like those two casseroles uh, all over, all over, you know, to stimulate your imagination right. and, and playfulness in the kitchen. Well, and I love, I, I mean, I love also the collection of chefs you have in there. I, I mean, if People are, are drawn to a particular um, celebrity chef. There's probably a, a recipe from them. I was noticing Jose Andres. I had just been looking at his uh, recent tapas book and you've got a recipe from him in there. 
And I, I before, uh, to get me in the mood for our talk, I made oh, one that's... of the blueberry smoothies. Yeah. And I will say I did not follow the recipe exactly, but it was a Good. very, <laughs> it was an inspiration. And I added a sprig of mint because I just thought oh, that color beautiful. combination. <laughs> so, I um, love it that you didn't follow the recipe completely. <laughs> I love it. That's Why great. You? you know, if you're making a smoothie, hey, what do I have in here that might, you know, I could throw in too? Hey, that's great. You know, between smoothies and stir fries, like smoothies take all my fruits and stir fries take all my vegetables. <laughs> and we can clear out the fridge and fruit basket pretty, pretty quick. Um, I do want to move into some of the great questions that we have had come in on our Facebook conversation. Um, and before I do that, though, I do want to remind our viewers, if you've been recent to our conversation, we are having a giveaway of uh, 10 copies of um, Frankie's book, Diet for a Small Planet, the 50th anniversary edition. And then also we are giving away uh, 10 sets of Dr. Bronner's All One Magic, Magic All One Chocolate. And this was launched just this past year. It is a vegan chocolate bar that tastes absolutely amazing. Um, and so if you wanna enter the giveaway for the book and the chocolate, like the Going Green Facebook page and jump into the conversation uh, on Facebook with either a favorite plant-based recipe or a question for our conversation. And if we don't get to all the questions while we're live, uh, we will write the questions in the comments afterwards. So uh, to start with here, we have a question from Carrie, and I think this is a pretty common obstacle question. For a big meat eater, what's the first step you would take to start heading towards uh, a vegan lifestyle or a plant-based lifestyle? What are some easy first steps? Gosh, you know, just maybe once a week, um, think about, oh, and with the spirit I've been promoting of uh, just uh, experimenting and playing with it, just try w once a week, you know, to try not to feel like, oh, I've got to do this all, you know, I've got to give it up right now, but just, oh, what, once or twice a week, you know, I could try uh, this or that and, and see how you feel. Because I, I was saying, you know, that for me, I just felt so much better. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So I think that, that, um, you know, that anything that is so personal and daily <laughs> that to do it overnight probably doesn't make sense for a lot of people. So I would just suggest starting, you know, look at the book, look at what appeals to you um, and try it. And then maybe, oh, you know, you didn't miss the meat that time. <laughs> then right. maybe you could try it again and try to do that a few times a week. So that that's that's my advice is uh, right. that yeah. journey, the journey. Right, not to try to go cold turkey because that might sink the sink the ship port sails, but uh, but you know, just once a week and, and move on from there. Um, and so then it I doesn't also, it, yeah, sorry, it just it's not a sacrifice. It's an adventure. That's the, adventure. Yeah. Food adventures yeah. are fantastic. I love doing that, especially with kids. The kids love going on food adventures if it's coaxed as an adventure and not <laughs> as something weird. Um, yeah, I, moving meat more towards more towards flavoring rather than the big center of the meal. Like for example, with a stir fry, you know, if you're if you're trying to transition to move the meat towards towards more of a of, a, of an addition rather than the, the core part of it uh, can also help with that transition. Um, yeah, and uh, soups are something that I mean, I, don't, I I make a lot of soups. We don't live in a cold climate here in San Diego, but it's just so easy to start something in the morning and and then it's ready in the evening. And uh, that's another way to use meat as more flavoring rather than the center of the meal. Uh, so uh, Kara has asked a good question about availability. Uh, she recently moved into an area where organic produce is not as prevalent. So what are your thoughts about eating local conventionally grown uh, produce if it's not organic? Well, no, I think we do what we can do. And if it's, I, you know, the more that you can choose that, which is best for all, and we can't always do that. So not to feel, you know, not to self-blame. You do what you can do and, and just recognizing that every choice we make does ripple out. And if we are able to choose organic, we're not just helping ourselves, but helping farmers not to be exposed, um, but we do what we can do. And, and uh, 
don't let don't be discouraged because you can't go the whole nine yards so to speak that is is my my um i think um that's all that we we can be expected to do <laughs> so right absolutely yes you do what you can and you can't you can't uh you know berate yourself for what's not an option for you um organic also, certification I, I just, oh go ahead oh i just wanted to say that again that every choice we do make you know that what you are choosing what that you can that you are sending signals out through the marketplace that there is a demand for this so um you know that and and speaking up to the grocery store managers about what you would like to see that's you know we can do it in a nice way not a snarky way i'm sure and and just you know that the more people speak up as well it's not just our dollars right but it's we can voice our desire for more organic and more a variety of plant foods it will make a difference absolutely but and the organic certification is is important when your supply chain is opaque when you can't see where your food's coming from but if you're uh, small family farms can't always pursue organic certification That's but if you can know what they're doing and know their practices the certification is is not essential i would i would encourage uh, people in that situation um i live in a rural area and and there are a lot of farmers around me and uh you know i get my eggs from one spot and and my produce from down the road and it's not certified but i know the farmer and so that's that's the other good thing um and the other thing as you were saying that eating more produce is better even if it's not organic uh there are still benefits to it um of course you can wash you can wash it with dr bronner's yes. at castile soap and rinse it um and so that will help as well but uh you, you don't need to um you don't need to necessarily have that organic certification. Uh, so another question has come in from Mario. Um, who is currently your inspiration as uh, people, as far as someone involved in the plant-based community? And what are there any documentaries that you have seen that you would recommend on this topic? Well, my key inspiration is my daughter, Anna, <laughs> at Real Food Media. and. Um, she would probably know about documentaries that I wouldn't. So I would recommend that you go to her website. Um, and um, yeah, I think. Uh, and her, her website is Real Food Media? Real Food Media, mm -hmm. Real Food Media. And uh, Anna LaPay. So definitely uh, check that out. Um, there are, and that's another thing, there are, there are plant-based documentaries nowadays. There shouldn't used to be. You know, but we've seen a lot. Uh, Dr. Bronner's has even um, sponsored some of them, and that's been a way that has educated a lot of people as well. Uh, Carolyn wanted to know if the book "Daring Democracy" is currently in stores. Is it Probably released? Not. It's yes. Okay. It came out in 2017, um, okay. but I know it's still available and more relevant than ever. I wrote this book with a young man, 49 years my junior, and we agreed on every word and uh, became fast friends. And so it was a, a just a wonderful project because it was all about possibility, how we can, what is happening to really make a, a more accountable democracy to us and not to mm -hmm. private interests. So that's the spirit of it. It's very much about solutions. That is, that's the theme I have noticed with you. It's about solutions. It's about positive thinking and moving forward. Um, you have described yourself as a hope monger, uh, which is a beautiful term uh, because it looks for the positive and not just laments over, over the negative. How did, how did you come up with the, the term hope monger? I don't recall, except that I do know, I always add to that hope comes in action, that if we aren't acting, it's very hard to believe other people can change, right? And so mm -hmm. every step we take that aligns our own lives with our values and what we want for the world, we become more powerful and we embody hope because we say, oh, if I can do this, then others can. So it, it's really about a certain kind of hope. And I often stress too that it, human beings don't need certainty of outcome in order to take hope-based action, all we need is a sense of possibility that perhaps our action 
can make a difference. And certainly with food, every, every choice we make is rippling out. So um, I don't know, this is just such a source of hope for me every day to be enjoying uh, a diet that I feel is aligned with what can allow the biodiversity to thrive and what can allow others to thrive. Um, you know, still we have this incredible problem of hunger in the world today where one in three of us don't get adequate food. And it's just, um, that's the spirit um, that I'm suggesting about hope. Right. Well, once we take action individually, we might inspire other people as well. They see what's yes. possible. They, we were the guinea pig. Um, Somebody's see, always watching, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And I know you've inspired so many people. You're a case in point there. Um, so there are so many great recipes I'm seeing coming in on the Facebook page. We're certainly going to leave that as a resource uh, for people. Um, but we have a couple more questions as well. Um, Cara, uh, I'm so sorry. Wendy asked if there was a particular country that inspired you in your recipes. Hmm, no. No, not really. Uh, early on, uh, that's what's changed so much, I think, is our appreciation of all of the different cuisines that have such rich plant-based, planet-based cuisines. But when I wrote the first book, um, that was less true. I think in the, in the Celebrity Chef, you'll see quite a variety of uh, their contributions. Um, particularly, I am drawn, however, to Indian food um, and uh, that palate and uh, they have perfected in some sense, you know, so many different ways to use, um, use, for example, tonight for dinner, I, we had the orange lentils that are so pretty. And uh, um, so I use uh, Indian seasoning. Um, so that's, I guess, my favorite, although I love the, the Mediterranean uh, cuisine. And uh, one of my recipes in the book is I took the the Latin America rice and beans um, a combo, which people take for granted. And I shifted the palate to Mediterranean oh, and yum. I called it Roman rice and beans. And so that's the kind of recipe that you can play with. And, and you know, think about maybe one cuisine and trying some of those same combos with, but with a different flavor palette and see if it can work. And I think it does in that recipe, so. I love that, that looks so, that sounds so fun. Now here in San Diego, it's, it's uh, before dinner. So all of this is making me very hungry. Um, I do have one last question. It's actually kind of a twist on one that Carolyn asked here. And there are several we didn't get to, but we will answer in the comments. Um, Carolyn brought up the issue of, of uh, how do you eat uh, filling meals that are plant-based that aren't so carb heavy um, because people who are diabetic, insulin dependent, they need to be very careful about their carb consumption. So uh, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you do the plant-based without it being so carb heavy? Well, let me just say about diabetes, that diabetes has leapt four to five fold and that is largely from ultra processed foods and a lot of sugar. And uh, I think uh, a plant-based diet is a way to heal uh, I had a dear friend about diabetes who became, you know, moved into this world and, and uh, of plant-based. So I, I, I think that it's not the carbs, the type of carbs that highly processed and sugar that is the diabetic threat. And it's a huge, huge international problem. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, the, just the term carbs, it's kind of a, kind of a downer, right? And, and so, um, just to understand that when you're eating in the plant world, you're also getting fiber, which is so important to our health. And that's one of the key things that is missing in this highly processed, ultra processed diet. So celebrate that fiber and celebrate all the vitamins and minerals that you're getting. And, um, and uh, so it's, it's um, you know, and, and understand, and we have, like you said, at the end of the book, you know, some examples of how much protein you get from this and that food, but but virtually everything contributes a little, somewhat, and we need less than we thought we did. And so we could just free ourselves from that concern. But certainly peas, beans, and lentils, including nut and, and nuts, that's the highest intensity uh, in the plant world of protein. Mm -hmm. So, and you, you know, if sprinkling some sunflower seeds on the top of your soup or, uh, you know, um, toasting some, some uh, other kinds of seeds and nuts and 
adding them to a dish is always a, you know, it's a fun thing to do. And if you're all concerned, there's a way to add more protein to a particular meal. Right, absolutely. And to eat things as, as close to nature as you can. I mean, that's where the phrase whole food comes from is, you know, even, even a, a white rice or a white flour that, that is refined, that is processed, but to eat it closer to its, its natural state where you have the husk or you have the, right. um, the hole there. And yeah. so that will up the fiber as well as the micronutrients. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, so we have, uh, we have unfortunately come to the end of our time here, which is uh, so much more to talk about um, and so many more topics in the book. So I very much encourage all of our viewers to look into uh, Diet for a Small Planet. If it's not already on your bookshelves, or even if it is, you'll wanna check out the 50th anniversary edition because it has updated uh, uh, science, updated uh, journey of uh, um, Frankie's journey, as well as uh, updated recipes. So really a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, we do have our 10 giveaway winners and I'm going to announce them here. I do hope I can pronounce everybody's names properly and we will be contacting you for your address uh, so our winners for our uh, giveaway of uh, Diet for a Small Planet and a set of Dr. Bronner's Magic All One Chocolate. Here we are, Carrie Dean, Kara Sterner Lubbold, Muriel Riley, Mario Aguilar, Caroline Reynolds, Michael Comba, Megan Lowry, Donna Rocco, Ziggy Zardust, Huma Kwaja, thank you so much for entering our giveaway and congratulations. I know that you will super enjoy your, uh, your book and your chocolate. And um, Frankie, I know you can't see it, but uh, in the comments, there's just a lot of um, people who are enjoying your energy and enjoying all the information that you have to share and the inspiration that you are. Uh, and so I just wanna thank you for joining me today and for writing this book that got this all started. It's been a joy. Oh, what a pleasure it is to talk to you. Thank you.